Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 Mary Scott Lecture featuring Dr. Cynthia Garcia Cole, whom we're very happy to have here. Uh, my name is Zaina Berengen and I'm a professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies, the department host of today's event. Our department is part of the Colorado State University College of Health and Human Sciences, which sponsors this lecture through the Mary Scott Lecture Fund. We will send everyone who registered for this event an email with the link to a recording of today's event. So that will be automatic and it will include closed captioning. The recording will also go onto our HDFS YouTube channel. So look for that. First, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that is now occupied by Colorado State University. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is a land-grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. So today's event will include the presentation by Dr. Garcia Cole, and then there will be a follow-up Q&A um, that would be moderated by Lisa Downhauer and myself. And Lisa Downhauer is Associate Professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. Um, we encourage you to drop questions in the Q&A function uh, and at any time throughout the presentation. And we will address as many of these questions as we can after Dr. Garcia's, Garcia Cole's talk. Um, we will address them one by one at the end. Now I'd like to turn things over to our department head, Dr. Julie Bronkard Riker, to um, provide more information about the Mary Scott Lecture Series, as well as our invited speaker. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today for this special event. The Mary Scott Lecture Series at CSU is made possible by a charitable trust endowed by Mary E. Scott to the College of Health and Human Sciences upon her death in 1984. The purpose of this series is to address a topic relevant to the lives of individuals and families. And I'm grateful to the college for the awarding us the 2022 lecture to the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. Now, I am honored to introduce this year's Mary Scott lecturer, Dr. Cynthia Garcia Cole. Dr. Garcia Cole is a developmental psychologist. She received her bachelor's degree from the University of Puerto Rico, her master's degree from the University of Florida, 
and her PhD from Harvard University. She is currently an adjunct professor in the pediatrics department at the University of Puerto Rico Medical School. Dr. Garcia Cole is also the Charles Pitts Robinson and John Palmer Barstow Professor Emerita at Brown University. Prior to moving back to Puerto Rico in 20, uh, 2011, Dr. Garcia Cole was a professor of education, psychology, and pediatrics for 30 years at Brown University. Her research focuses on the interplay of sociocultural and biological influences on child development, with particular emphasis on populations that live in at-risk conditions or are considered minorities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Garcia Cole. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, glad to be speaking on this topic. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry that we have a pandemia, pandemic, I guess in English, um, and we can't be there in presence, but still thrilled that I have the opportunity to share some of my knowledge and my experience about child development. Um, so I coined this word culturalism and I will be defining key uh, topics, but I want to talk today about the notion that our field is struggling and has been struggling for about 140 years now with notions of diversity, racism, and how do we conceptualize the development of what we call now minoritized populations. So can I have the first slide, please? So let's start with the outline of the talk. First, I will start with definition of key concepts like culturalism, diversity, racism, etc. I will briefly give my conceptualization of how child development was conceived from its inception in the mid, mid 1800s to when I actually started grad school and then what has happened in the last uh, 30 years. In the next um, topic is I wanna share my experiences as a graduate student confronting this legacy of uh, biology and maturation. I will briefly talk about the empirical evidence that I saw at the time, but nobody was really looking at it and has exploded in the last 30 years that really brings about a change into the theoretical paradigm of child development and then introduce some contemporary theories that are you know, that are key to the new conceptualization of children's development. Then I'll talk about minor minoritized children. For example, what has happened with the impact of COVID in these populations and how it really speaks to the notion, the importance of context and culture, et cetera, in children's development and also the evidence from immigrant children or children from immigrant backgrounds, how it speaks to this new way of thinking about children's development. And then I'll just end by thinking about what would that be, that new um, view of children's development would look like. So can I have the next slide, please? So let's talk about some key concepts. The first one is culturalism. So I'm using the notion of ism, sexism, racism, ageism, all of these kinds of things, but really thinking about that culture is the basis for exclusion in your beautiful introduction about inclusion in Colorado State. You know, this notion that other people are there, what I call the othering of others. And in culturalism, the other is based on language, on the way that we communicate and use our hands, on our own values, on histories of migration, on rituals, on food, on phenotypes, appearances, etc. And a great example that I was bombarded with when I came into graduate school was the culture of deprivation that was so uh, 
prevalent in the 1960s coming from sociology and anthropology in use and it was a literature that basically looked at minoritized populations as totally deficient as what's wrong with these people why they can't be like us why they don't use the kind of things that we do why they don't parent the way we do at the same time, I want to bring issues of diversity that I use both from biology and the social sciences that emphasize the value of differences in universal processes. If you look very carefully at Darwin, and I had the privilege of being at Galapagos and really see how uh, diversity happened in the Galapagos, which was, you know, on one side of the island, you know, the birds had the, the, the peak the beak this way and on the other side of the island because of the geography and the land and the, and the plants, they would be a, have a completely different beak and how basically context has been so much part of our evolution and how we think of it as a biological process rather than a contextual one. So that's my definition of diversity is the value of differences in universal processes because we need to be able to adapt to different places. And then racism, I introduced racism to child development in the 1990s with a group of colleagues of mine like Margaret Spencer and John Ogbu, uh, Bonnie McLeod and others where we started talking about how racism had different expressions. One is the structural one, where if you are of this particular ethnic group or ethnicity or race, you know, you are shunned from buying a house in a particular good neighborhood that has a good school system. So that structural systemic is basically all around us. And then there's the social, which is groups of people that decide that others are not welcome in a particular place. And then there's the personal one on an interaction. My children used to go with my nanny's children to the mall and they would come back and say, why do they always follow Jolemi, who was the darkest of all four of them every time that we go to a store? So they would know basically firsthand the notion of having personal relationships being colored, if I can use that word, from, um, from, from that notion of who is accepted, who is welcome or not. Let's go to the next one. So I'm gonna try to identify to you the roots of why I think when I came to this field in the 1970s and 80s through graduate school that it was very homogeneous and universal and I'm going to talk about a couple of theories that I think were very important in the development of child development in the US and the first one is Arnold Gesell. Arnold Gesell was a pediatrician at Yale University and he was also considered a psychologist, a child psychologist because he dealt with a lot with development. And he basically postulated a maturational developmental theory. And I want to use this as an example of how this was used to basically create the way that we think about children, at least until the 1960s and 70s. Let's go to the next one. So what he was amazing at was he was a great observer. And he decided that instead of thinking about you know, like Freud talked about childhood in, in inciting those insights from adults, he wanted to observe kids and he sat and observed kids and took notes for hours and hours and hours and documented the patterns in the ways that children develop. And what he postulated was basically that it was mostly maturation. Can I have the next one? that children go through similar and predictable sequences. That this is the way life is based on children. I must say at Yale University in New Haven in the 1930s 
and 40s. Okay, but you know, that's the way we used to do theories before. We used to work with one particular group and basically extrapolate to the rest of humanity from that. He talked about environment, but environment for him only caused individual differences. So the individual differences that I talk about, the diversity that I talked about, which is adaptations to different environments that kids that, he didn't acknowledge that. For him, it was only individual difference, only in the rate of maturation, but everything would go in the same predictable and similar sequence. And he created the notion that we could do evaluations of development, that we could get a, do an exam that we could bring a child in a two particular place and do an assessment and really tell parents where these kids are in terms of the different um, areas of development. Can I have the next one, please? And so this is an example of Gazelle's stages of development, and you can see that they are very close to what we think or we used to think about development in sequence, in stages, et cetera, et cetera. Can I have the next one? So in 1925, he created the Gazelle Developmental Schedules, which was a precursor to the Bailey and to other, uh, because he was really interested in the first six years of life. And he claimed that any one of us, educators, pediatricians, psychologists, anybody who works with infants, teachers, can do an assessment of the developmental status of infants and young children could be made by just interacting and creating particular, you know, asking kids to do. And these evaluations could be done by any professionals like psychologists, educators, and pediatricians. Next one. He established normative trends in four areas of growth and development, motor, adaptive, what we call now cognitive, language and personal social behavior. And those of us who do developmental assessments know that those are the areas pretty much that we do nowadays in terms of our assessments. So even if I feel very critical of his work, I want to talk about his contributions to developmental sciences in the 20th century. And those are, he was very one, one of the first that talked about behavior and the brain and the appreciation of investment in the rapid developing young brain. He was interested up to the year of six years. And we know now from all the neuroscience that we know that he was absolutely right. In the first six years, the brain is really like a sponge taking everything dropping things off, letting go what we don't use, and integrating everything else. He was the first theory to systematically study children to you know, value watching a six-month-old versus a 12-month-old versus a three-year-old versus a six-year-old. And he, again, talked about predictability, normally, normative growth among children. The, Legacy is that it was mostly maturational with some environmental differences and some organic variations, meaning there used to be brain damage, there used to be syndromes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the legacy that he gave us. And he also gave us a recognition of individual developmental and environmental needs of young children to basically support, to basically be based on on those maturational stages, let's not get them, let them be wasted. Let's give kids according to where they are, what they need from the environment to keep on moving on. So that's Arnold Gazelle. Let's go to the next. And then the other one that I wanna talk about is Jean Piaget, which we all know, um, he was still alive when I was in, in grad school. And what fascinated me about Piaget was that he was not a developmental psychologist, nor a pediatrician, nor anybody who was interested in children. He was actually a biologist who used to work on mollusks. And one day he decided that he really was fascinated by the notion of the origin of knowledge. How do we human beings create knowledge? 
And so he started thinking that it was, and he created, you know, the cognitive development, the big boost on understanding children's cognitive development. Next one, please. And he presented to us the child as a scientist. I mean, these kids were running around, his three kids was his, his sample, running around and he saw them as, you know, picking up things and putting things together like little scientists, independent of the environment. The environment was something that it was out there for kids to work on as scientists. So the immediate environment demands was what brought them to think about process and problems in, in scientific ways, but it was also based on biological maturation. There were stages that were coming. Let's have the next line universal processes and stages and think about that this they were working pretty much simultaneously i mean though the piaget was a lot you know older in the same idea that universal processes were working that stages were universal just by working on his three children next one so just to give you an example one of the mechanisms that he talked about that kids are confronted by something new in the environment, something that puzzles them as a, as a little scientist. And you basically have two ways of dealing with that new information. You assimilate it. Oh yeah, not yet, not yet. You assimilate it, you get it, you, oh yeah, oh, this is an example of something that mommy did last week, or this is an example of the bird doing this and you come up to equilibration again, but then there comes another, another situation and the disequilibration can be, you can accommodate or you can assimilate. And both of those ways are ways that we really deal with trying to get to equilibrium again. Next. Most of us know or knew his stages of development. You know, I was um, instructed uh, this is the way, you know, life was. Children universally go through this. They, uh, this is the way it happens. You know, Piaget was amazing. They managed to describe this universal process that needs very little from the environment, except that the environment triggers some questions that help you uh, you will answer depending on what stage you are. Next slide, please. So what are his contributions to development? And let's look at those. He created a cognitive revolution. When I started in grad school, that's what everybody was studying. Cognition. Cognition about language, cognition about, uh, you know, object concept, cognition about, you know, numbers, everything was like how kids learn numbers, how kids learn to read and write, how kids learn how to think, why all of a sudden they, they become symbolic and all of a sudden, you know, the way that they used to do prob uh, problems or projects changes completely. He also gave us as Gissel a systematic observation of children that it really is worthwhile. Think about it. This is the first time that science really decides that children are worth studying, that there's something to be gained, not only for the children's sake, but for our understanding of humanity, our understanding of humans and how we develop and what's necessary. Of course, the mechanisms of development, of accommodation and assimilation and stages are also very much part of his uh, legacy as Gesell. And you can see that aside from the cognitive revolution, the mechanisms of development stages, the maturation and universal are very much something that both Gesell and Piaget had in common. Next. And also the beauty of the complexity and simplicity of development, right? That yin and yang, that notion that it's very complex and at the same time you accommodate or you assimilate, 
or you are in the stage and that's what happens because you're on that stage or you are, you know, in the next then and that's why we can explain the beauty of change over time. So the next slide and put it all if you can. Thank you. Is my way of thinking about how I was taught child development. So child development refers to the process through which human beings typically grow and mature from infancy through adulthood. And the different aspects of growth and development that are measured include physical growth, cognitive growth, and social emotional growth. Child development focuses on the change that takes place in humans as they mature from birth to about age 17. It's like development stops, you know, like we're done. We're done. All the all the important thing happens. I don't know what happens later, but that's that's the way that it was done. Other people were into all people and that was that was a different world out there. The stages that we were interested in were infancy, early childhood, middle childhood and adolescence. And the traditional na nativist perspective assumed that developmental changes are embodied in the genes or represented in neural programming that matures or gets established by experiences. And the experience can modify some maturational rate, but it cannot introduce qualitative new forms. So lo and behold, I come to the United States to go to grad school. And let's see what the, that was like. So I started reading and understanding that, you know, these people had created a uh, theories of development that were very contextualized. One in Geneva, you know, a professor in Geneva, the other one professor at Yale. And there was no mention of culture at all. There was no mention of diversity at all. And sometimes I saw very clear racism. So one example was the notion of teenage pregnancy it was very much considered a problem, a big problem when I moved to the US. And but my grandmother was a teenage mother and I was like, uh, was she that bad? I mean, let's think about Hmm. for me it was like, you know what? I think culture really matters on how we define and value diversity and how we define and value uh, expressions, different expressions around the world. So when I did my PhD, I said, you know what, I, I need some refreshment here because I'm, I'm going to go really berserk, I'm really thinking about everything is maturation, everything is universal. And we have the standards of, of what humans can do or not do or be or everything else based on this very narrow definition. So I did a minor in anthropology and I worked with Robert Levine and the Whitings. But then I realized that yes, there was this mention. We started pushing the envelope. Some of us, hey, culture matters, culture matters, and da 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 but it created what I call the chapter 13 phenomena. And I don't know if you've seen many of the books that we still have in child development. They basically talk about, oh, this is the way development is. Oh, by the way, chapter 13 talks about culture. And I was like, no, 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 no. Culture is not elsewhere. It is here. I mean, I look at the USA child rearing culture and it is so strange. They want kids to be individualized by the age of two. I mean, we call in Spanish infantes until the age of six. We carry them around. We don't let them do things by themselves because we think that they're going to get hurt. Are we bad parents? Because we think that individualism is not the way to be creating kids that early on. So let's go to the next one. And then I started looking at the literature 
on all of us, all the other people in the world. And I realized that normative was white middle class American. And the rest of the world, but especially colored was deviancy. So the rest of us were deviant. We needed to be taught how to be good parents. We needed to be straightened, to really be given the way, to really be acculturated to the way that's supposed to be, to this normative way of thinking about children, child rearing, schools, culture, etc. So let's go into the next one. When deficiencies were found, the efficiencies, and I should have put that in quotations, like low academic achievement, high rates of teenage pregnancy, or you know, drug abuse, they are due on that poem in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, either to genetic predispositions or cultural deprivation was considered a progressive stance that was used by uh, people that created Head Start. Okay, the progressive notion with Head Start was that we can, we can teach kids to be like us. We can teach parents to parent the kids so they can be like white middle class populations. So even though these populations were subject to racism, to segregation, to poverty, that was not thought of as the important place where we should be interviewing. The important place was in the microsystems, in the family, in the school, that we should acculturate them and get them to be just like we are. And that was at the point where most, go back for a moment because I haven't, and that was the point where most deviant individuals were white. I mean, I started doing research and I saw most of the research on teenage mothers were on black and Latina mothers. But when I look at the statistic, most of the teenage mothers at that point were white. They were not minoritized populations. They were just poor white, but they were not considered deviant. We were considered deviant because we could be considered deviant because we were phenotypically or culturally different. Okay. So let's go to the next. So my own perception was like, oh my God, people don't realize that they are cultural beings, that all of us are expressions of a culture. And that the chapter phenomena continue, the cultural difference in the USA seen as normative, is deficient, and then things exploded. The civil rights, and the demographic shifts in the US created pressure. Academia is not an ivory tower as we think it is. Yes, it is an ivory tower and I went to that ivory tower to become a grad student and, and, and to graduate, but it is not there. Everything in child development and science really reverberates with what's going on in the culture out there. So, civil rights, demographic shifts in the US, globalization, and the need of how to understand and intervene with the other. You know, how the imperialistic USA is going to be able to bring about the knowledge, this new technology of child development, both inside the US and out there. So all of a sudden, I realized that what we needed most than anything were new theories, because theories is what gives the purpose, the explanation, it helps you pick up whatever your variables are, etc. So let's look at the new theories that started. Oh, before then, 
before the, the new theories, there was also an internal pressure of the research done with this theoretical frameworks before. And all of a sudden people started going to Africa and to China and to Israel and to other people and started knowing, showing that, you know, some stages are there in the beautiful uh, film uh, Babies. You see how these babies develop all over the world pretty much the same way. But when you look at other uh, stages like formal operations or when you look at adolescence or even when you look at conservation in Guatemala, if you do conservation with the beakers and the materials in the US, the kids fail completely. But when you do use materials and things that are there, they show conservation and they sometimes are even new stages come up. So all of a sudden from within the science, the stages were being questioned, the universality. All of a sudden we start seeing that poverty really matters. The people who live in poor neighborhoods, parents have to adapt their parenting practices because it's unsafe out there. And so parents very wisely develop new techniques to figure out to be sure that their kids are going to behave out there the way they need to, to be able to come back home alive. So culture and socioeconomic context starts coming up in our science. We start seeing that parents and families have an incredible, incredible power into what kids become. And so attachment and all of the theories from Freud and other places that were saying parents really matter, we're saying, huh, if parents really matter, then it's not all maturation and straightforward. The next one, please. The importance of schools and neighborhoods. I mean, that's why we started Head Start. That's why there was a lot of emphasis in the 1960s in creating things at the neighborhood level that because of segregation did not work. Next slide, please. And so all of a sudden, you can have these developmental processes that these scientists had um, identified, but you needed a lot, the environment was a lot more important and created a lot of inputs to propose to move on. All of a sudden we realized that language was not as maturational as we thought it was because the rate of input from maternal input really matter. By the month, by eight months of age, I had differences according to mother's age and socioeconomic background in, in language maturation. And so all of a sudden, we also had from neuroscience, this whole notion that the brain actually was not complete at birth, but that the brain develop over time as a function of environmental input. We realized that we closed the eyes of kittens. If they didn't have the light coming in, the eyes would not develop. That context and input are incredibly important for those maturations to happen or not. Next slide. We also started seeing that even in prenatal development, the environment matter. There was this awful, awful experience of thalidomide that we were giving, you know, pregnant women a drug for their malabarriga, no other problem with their stomach on the first trimester. Little did we know that that drug would impede the normal development of limbs the arms and legs. So we all of a sudden started seeing all these places where environment really matter. Finally, we've had epigenetics, which is the, the sort of the last 20 years that tells us that even gene expression 
gene expression depends on environmental input. That we, you might have the gene for something the rest of your life. And if there's not for some genes and not others and not universal and everything, but that some aspects of development really need the environment to be able to express itself. And finally, again, in the last 20 years, we've seen that a lot of what happens in the womb environmentally, toxins, astalidomide, but stress also, all of these other kinds of environmental, you know, uh, that are not chemical, that are not, you know, inside the wound for chemical reasons. They become chemical, but their stress, life stress becomes part. And that that prenatal programming takes you all the way to diseases 40 years later, like heart disease and diabetes and all these things. So not only from the outside, but from the scientific knowledge, we realize that context is extremely important. Next slide, please. So let's talk about theories that have become quite important in this call I call social cultural revolution of the 1960s up to now in child development. That brings us a completely different view of child development. And that is the one from Lev Vygotsky. And really interesting, Lev died very early at the age of 41, I think it was, or 42. And he was a Russian psychologist who was based coming out with his psychist of, you know, a revolution. We can really move and create a country that can move everybody, everybody from the farmer, the factory worker, to an educated person, to an athlete, to a new place of development. And he created what's called the sociocultural theory. And he basically says that social learning comes before cognitive development. That actually social learning, the interactions that you have in your family, with your caretakers, with your nanny, in your preschool, very early on, the need to be part of that social group is the force that makes you develop cognitively completely different than Piaget at the same time. But what's interesting that he says, yes, children construct knowledge actively, but it's through social interactions. It's not a little, you know, scientist there with a rock and a little warm and stuff like that. It's because they are interacting all the time and they want to interact more and they want to be successful interactions with parents and siblings and classmates, et cetera. And so he talks about the more knowledgeable other, the MKO, I love that, because you can see it in, you know, in, in groups in a lot of countries where kids are very small, are part of multi-age groups. This notion of segregation by age is like a disaster according to this theory, because we want kids who know a lot and kids who don't. And then, you know, they want to be part of the yin and yang of, of the social hierarchy, and they're going to move on because they want to be like the kid who knows the most. Next one. The best learning occurs also in the zone of proximal development, which I will talk about in a moment. And why are we talking about him now? because his work was translated into the English in the 1960s. So nobody knew about his work because, you know, Russia was in a revolution and Europe was in a different place. And, you know, they were not, there were no exchanges, you know, of, of science. So his work, we start reading it in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And all of a sudden we realize, oh my God, culture is a major, pro, you know, proponent and catalyst for human development. Next slide, please. So I love one of his uh, particular concepts, which is the zone of proximal development, which is very simply put here. I can do this by myself. I can do this 
with some help, my parents, my older sibling, my peer or whatever. And this is out of my range right now. I can't do this even with help. And the notion of the zone of proximal development, I would love to be able to adapt it right now for the elderly and think about how can we promote human development in places where you know we put people and we put them in passive situations. Why don't we think about every single one of these individuals have a zone of proximal development and maybe we can have an interesting life to the very, very end by learning and developing up to that moment. Next slide, please. So what are the contributions of Lev Vygotsky? And let's look at them. Of course, the importance of the social interactions in both cognitive and psychosocial development. It's not one cognitive, maturational, one social, you know, your mother, your kids and the interactions. Everything is through cultural demands. The attention is shifted from the individual child, the universal child, the generic child, to a larger interactional units, parents, teaching, siblings that are part of a societal, of a construction, a social cultural construction of human development. Of course, cultural variability becomes center, stating that the development of children who are in one culture or subculture, and he used those words, may be totally different from children who are from other cultures. It's open, it's open. Development is open. Therefore, it would not be fitting to utilize the developmental experiences of children from one culture as a norm from children from another culture. Huh. And we have examples of people who really went off, became Vygotsky and I think it says, Barbara Rogoff and Tom Weisner, two of my favorite people in the world, good friends, but also like-minded that they were like, like me going, wait, this is not, this is not right. Look at Guatemala, they are developing. Look at people in the 1960s who are white middle class, but live in communes. What is different? How do we learn? How do we learn? What is universal and what is contextual? Let's go to the next one. Of course, Yuri Bronfenbrenner. So let's talk about Yuri. I also met him, so it's great to be talking about all these people that I really had a chance to meet. And he was a revolutionary. He was an uh, immigrant from Russia, I think it was from Europe and he came to the States and he did all most of his work in the Northeast of the United States, where he basically said, look, development is all about context. And it's not only the little interactions, it's all the systems of environments and their relationship between environments. And yes, biology matters. Yes, biology matters, but they're both intricately connected from the very, very beginning. Also, children affect environments and environments affect children. It's bi-directional, just like Arnold Samaroff. And the importance of studying children in multiple environments. Up to the moment that Yuri was around, environments meant parent-child interaction, families. All of a sudden, he said, no, 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 schools matter. And the relationship between family and schools really matter. So let's look at how he figured out, how he put out the world out there. Next slide, please. Everybody knows this. Um, it's been used fantastically in public health. In other, a lot of other disciplines are using it. And you know that it's concentric individual with all its biological predispositions and promises in the middle, and then you have all of these. But all of these matter. All of this interact. All of this are mutually influencing each other. 
it's really a very complex proposition to become an adult. To become an adult, a healthy adult, in a complex society that is like ours, is quite an amazing task. Next slide, please. So the contributions from URI, of course, we're talking about bioecological models. Next. Many contexts really matter, not only mother-child interaction. And then all of a sudden we have to talk with economists and we have to work with sociologists and we have to work. My book, my beautiful book that I love so much, 2009, we spent a year with an anthropologist studying the different cultures that I talk about in terms of their development during middle childhood. So this is really a revolutionary way of thinking about and doing science and doing interventions because that's the big question. Then if you want to change development, where do you start? Next one, please. Culture is included. Da. Everybody's citing it, but nobody is measuring culture. Dear, so we have it theoretically now. And that's where we come in 2017. It took us that while uh, five of my students and I debunk Yuri, uh, not debunk it, but really question the notion. If you can go back to the previous slide for a moment. So look at the macro system. Where is culture? Culture is all the way out there. And it's defined as attitudes and ideologies of the culture. Go back to our model that we published in 2017, where we basically say, you know what? Culture is everywhere. The microsystem, the exosystems, everything is permeated by culture. The way that we organize preschool in Turkey, where I work with them there, it's quite different the way that they think about it to the way that we think about it in the US. So we broke through Brunfenbrenner and said, no, it's not in the macro system out there. It's everywhere. And these are not rigid concentric circles. This is a circle that it's moving all the time, all the time in and out. There are entrances, they're like membranes. So all of a sudden, what happens in school really matters. You know, what happens at work really matters for your parenting, and it really matters for the, how the kid does in preschool. This is coming and going. This is all the time moving. This is a life system, not rigid, not completely predictable. Next slide. So I want to bring us to now to minoritized kids because I want to talk about COVID and I want to talk about immigrants. And this is our theoretical model that we created in 1996. And we have um, 12, 12, 2016, we did a new one with immigrants in mind and it has been moved and shift and pain and wonderfully change over time, which is the way that science should be. But basically for us, I said, if you're going to look at minoritized kids, you have to look at a major, major sources of influence. And that is the fact that most societies have what's called social position variables, that most societies have a hierarchy and that that hierarchy through segregation, through racism, prejudice, you know, um, discrimination and oppression, and through segregation, create environments that are not the same. It's not the same to grow up in a homogeneous place with all the resources that you need in schools, for recreation, for parenting, for housing, than it is to go to a place where the houses are full of lead, 
where the houses are full of cockroaches and you get asthma and then all of a sudden asthma affects all your learning. I needed to put out what were the major contextual factors that were really bringing about what I call the developmental competencies and minoritized kids. You have an adaptive culture that parents bring or they pass one generation to the other. Yes, there are child characteristics. Yes, there's something that the children bring and something that the family bring and something that the adaptive culture brings. But all of these things, you know, kids, these kids have to do the same task of cognitive, social, emotional, linguistic, but they also have ad added tasks like becoming bicultural, like coping with racism. And we need to talk about this in development. So next slide, please. So what has been the evidence, how I've seen the COVID, the impact of COVID and minoritized population given my framework? And let me tell you what the data is right now, and I've been tracking it over and over and over. This is not a data presentation. This is a thoughtful presentation. This is a theory. Let's think, let's talk, let's question. Let's really critically look at our field. So what happens with our kids and our families? First of all, there's overrepresentation on positive COVID-19, on hospitalizations and on death. So we are more of us die, more of us got COVID, more of us got hospitalizations than other populations. We are overrepresented in job and income loss and economic uncertainty. You know, many of our families didn't have computers in their house. Many of our families didn't have stable internet. They only had cellular phones. And all of a sudden we needed for them to be teachers and for their kids to sit for eight hours in front on a cell phone. And I've seen four and five kids using the same cell phone to be able to go to school. Next slide. The food and housing insecurity, the same. Overrepresentation of minoritized populations. Next slide. Serious disruption in child care and education. Many um, middle class families, we manage, we did what we could do. A lot of our low income families could not be able to deal with lack of child care. They had to stay home to take care of the kids because the parents couldn't be there to take care of those or those you know, uh, child care centers, a lot of them were closed and their education disruptions were major. Next. The discrepancy of access to technology. More black, Latino, Hispanics, you name it, they could not get the CARE Act stimulus checks because they couldn't figure out how to ha have access to it. Next slide. And on top of everything else, Asian, Latinos, Black, but especially Asian because it was, China was identified as the beginning of this, more racial, ethnic, overt discrimination than anything else. So all of a sudden, why? Why? Why this? And according to the theory that we put out before, how I see it is that pandemic created an economic downfall that impacted way more the BIPOC population. So that was the evidence. That's what the numbers show it. Well, how do we interpret and how we explain that? Let's look at the next one. The argument that I'm presenting is that existing racism, existing inequality created more impact. So you can fill out this blank, existing racism. So they didn't have 
you know, they don't graduate from top universities because they don't get good education from early on. I mean, you can really fill this, this boxes down forever and ever on why this impact was so differentially devastating for people of color. Next slide, please. Let's talk about immigrant children and why this way of thinking about minoritization, racialization of children and families really makes sense and it has to be discussed and talked about in our classes of child development and in the way that we conceptualize science and interventions. And so I'm going to give you three studies that really talked about how receiving context really matter for immigrants. The immigrants are not the issue. The issue is how immigrants are received and incorporated into the receiving context. And the first one is the book that I was telling you where we studied children from Cambodian backgrounds, from Dominican backgrounds, and from Portuguese backgrounds all in the same school systems, but they came very differently. Refugees, 300 years of migration, and very recent migrants. And what we find is that their migration history and the school context that they end up really shape developmental pathways tremendously. We also went and started thinking about, am I done with time? Yes, no, in your big, okay. Um, the second way that we looked at this was around states and we figure out that the rate of graduation in different states for the same immigrant groups were very much a function of how the states were pro-immigrant or against immigrants for that matter. And the last one, was a study that we did on looking at Europe, um, Canada, and the United States. And again, we found that child well-being of immigrant groups was a function of how the policies were in different countries. Next slide, please. So this is the end. Let me just grab something to drink. So, we need to redo all the way that we teach child development because stages of development are basically out of the window. They are heuristic. I love talking about adolescents. I love talking about infants, but very loosely. Development has to be observed, explained, and measured in context. If we don't do it that way, we're really creating these clarifications of why these groups differ and everything else. We're all cultural beings. We have to, scientists, science, child development, everything that we do is within a culture. And so what we need to be looking at is how the culture is permeating and how the children are developing within those contexts. I think I am done. Ah, of course, the other one is that poverty. Oh, I have some more. Poverty, inequality, racism are very important to think about. Context have been taken into account in assessments and interventions. Let's not bring interventions over. Development starts from preconception and it means environmental preconception. And guess what? development happens throughout lifetime. It doesn't stop in adolescence. I am still negotiating my ethnic identity every time that I go to the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture, Dr. Cole. We appreciate you sharing your research and insights you've gained with us. I am Dr. Lisa Donhauer, and I'll be helping Dr. Berjan in moderating our Q&A session. 
So the first question we have in the chat is asking you to speak to the so-called evidence based intervention programs and how they interact with culture today. OK, so the evidence, it's amazing because we talk about evidence based interventions. But when we look at the interventions, most of them are created and standardized and developed in particular populations. So to me, it's an open empirical question. How evidence based populations work in other populations. And from this theoretical perspectives, you would be really careful and cautious and you would measure the context of the original intervention and the context of where this new population and see what are the continuities and the continuities in the context. My prediction would be that if the contexts are very similar, that evidence base is going to work. If the contexts are very dissimilar, be careful because you might do more harm than good. And you know, I've been working with people around the world that are very, there was a special issue that just came out in uh, human development, that it was about people from Africa, people from other countries really questioning uh, the good of bringing particular interventions that had been developed in one culture that were applied like anything else and that they were really mistaken uh, and harm both parents and kids. So I would look at people who are working in other countries and see what they have to say about that. But there is evidence that, you know, we need to be careful about evidence based uh, interventions if they have not been done cross-culturally validated. Another question that we have is uh, related to attachment security. There have been some studies on uh, using the Q sort for mm. parents rating their ideal yes. child. And so yes. when Italian parents have rated their ideal child or Japanese parents have rated their ideal child, it's the secure child. And so it comes out for the secure child. You know, yes. Well, yeah. yes, and yes, and that's beautiful. I mean, I am all I'm not saying that there are no universal processes, okay? I'm saying that it's an open empirical question. This is all theory. It's an open empirical question. What things are going to be universal regardless of where we are? And one question that I would ask is if these are all middle class families, because I've had this uh, arguments with um, with Mark Bornstein over and over. Um, very, very fascinating arguments because he's very much into saying to me, well, I've 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 tested this developmental process in this five countries and it all looks the same and say, OK, tell me. The level of education of the parents, tell me how westernized they are. Tell me how much they are very much their value system is bicultural or very much. You know, uh, looking, have you dealt with? We seem to have lost Dr. Garcia Cole's connection. Um, if you could stand by for just one moment. Hello, Dr. Garcia Cole. It's nice to have you back. Um, if you could unmute yourself, uh, we'll let you continue with uh, your answer to that very important question. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Dr. Garcia Cole. Thank you. OK, OK. So, you know, she studies Jamaican youth and Jamaican youth who are very acculturated in the in, to U.S. culture. And, you know, their worldview is U.S. 
So, you know, to, I, I think that culture cannot be studied by categorically putting people in boxes, that culture needs to be studied as cultural activities on a daily basis, which is the way that uh, Barbara Rogoff and Tom Weisner and uh, Vygotsky talks about and really get a sense. I mean, they're very westernized Japanese. I mean, they're very western. I don't know if they would call themselves westernized, but they're very much into the same value system that we have here of work and technology and everything else. I mean, that's not traditional Japanese culture. So I, I go into a culture and I study deeply the culture before I can say this is how Cambodians in Providence, Rhode Island are thinking about life and child development and parenting, not Thank you. And we have um, the next two questions are related. Um, so I'm going to try to combine these for you. Mm -hmm. How do you measure the impact of culture? And can you expand more on the concept of culturalism and how it's similar and dissimilar from racism? Right. So um, I just talked about how I like to measure culture, which is in, yes, we do values. Yes, we talk about the ideal child and everything else, but we observe, you know, we we put, you know, we 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 go into homes and we go into temples. You know, I so I went into the Cambodian temples in in Providence, Rhode Island. And you know, I went to the Dominican parties to really think about how families, you know, how kids were it was midnight and they were still running around you know, with multi-age groups and stuff like that, and really got a sense. And then I went to the Portuguese, and the Portuguese were very much into being American. They didn't care about anything else. They're white, they're phenotypic, you know, they're going to become Americans as quickly as possible. So for me, the notion of daily practices, and that's how we put it, becoming bringing culture from the macro into the micro in that particular uh, publication, I talk a lot about its daily practices. Let's look at the daily practices. And if the daily practices are exactly the same in one place or another, they have the same culture, even if they're in two different parts of the world, right? I mean, they still have a lot in common. Uh, so daily activities is how I like to routines what is important about why, why do you do this? Uh, Tom Weisner has a wonderful interview that he sits down with parents and he asks, he observed parents and then he asked them about the meaning, meaning making of those particular rituals. And, and then um, the other question about culturalism and racism. So culturalism is you and I can look exactly the same, but I have a different language, right? I'm white. I'm blonde, I'm blue eye, but we have a different language and we have a different way of raising kids. So it's not based on race as a phenotypic stuff, but as ageism, racism, culturalism, all of these things are basically social categories that people use to exclude, to say, oh, you're different. They used to say to me, you don't look Puerto Rican. I'm like, what is a Puerto Rican? So, oh, so I had this. Imagine me telling me, <laughs> you don't look Puerto Rican. I'm like, so what is a Puerto Rican supposed to look like, my dear? Oh, you know, the hood and all. And I'm like, no, no, sweetie, I don't know. Tell me what a Puerto Rican is supposed to look like if I don't look Puerto Rican. OK, so that uh, that is racism. That is not culturalism because, you know, she thought that, you know, I was one of them. And then all of a sudden I opened my mouth, have my accent. Whoops, she's different. Where is she from? Thank you very much. So I think we are out of questions and I, I appreciate the thoughtful answers. Mm -hmm. So thank you for the opportunity. I hope that the only thing that I want from talks like this is 
for people to think, to think critically, to question, to be sure that what we, our own culture does not permeate everything that we do when we're dealing with people who are different from us in particular ways, whatever those ways are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garcia Cole. We really okay. appreciate the time that you engaged with us. Um, and now that we're out of time, I'd like to thank everyone once again for joining us today and for your participation in conversations. This concludes our 2022 Mary Scott Lecture. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.